Hello class, and let's continue off where we left off in the previous session. We talked about amplifiers. In this session, we're going to talk about oscillators. I hope you understand what mechanical oscillation is. When I have, for example, a blade here, and I deflect it, and I let it go, it oscillates. This frequency of oscillation is called the natural frequency. And if I want to sustain this oscillation to make it go on, I need to give it a little input to sustain the oscillation. Otherwise, it will come to an end at what particular point of time. And the frequency of oscillation depends on the length of the material. So I'll make it longer, the frequency is lower. I'll make it shorter, the frequency is higher. So understanding natural frequencies, the same concepts are going to be extended in the field of electronics to understand oscillation. So what is oscillation? So the simplest way to have, understand oscillation is by having an inductor and a capacitor in a network. Inductors, as I said, is like a flywheel. It can store current if I give it an input and I stop giving the input, it will continue to run in the same direction until the energy is dissipated. In other words, if I let it run in one direction, it's, I've stored the energy in it. And if I stop, the continue, current continues to flow in the same direction after the power is interrupted. But in the case of a capacitor, it's the opposite. If I apply energy and store it in it, store energy in a, in a, in a capacitor, it will reverse back in the opposite direction. In an inductor, the output it's in the same direction of input. In other words, if I spin it clockwise, the output is clockwise. But if I, and I have a spring, if I compress it as my input, the output is expansion, not compression. Yes? So, understanding that, when I have an inductor and a capacitor coupled together, in this case, I have potential energy and kinetic energy. When the blade is in the maximum potential, I've stored the energy. When it's moving to the past the center point, it's got maximum kinetic energy. When it goes back to the other end, it's maximum potential energy. Maximum kinetic energy, maximum potential energy. This process of going past from kinetic to potential is what oscillation is in a mechanical system. So the same thing, when I have an inductor and it's running in forward direction, all the energy I transfer to a spring, I compress it. And this dies out of energy. This compressed spring releases the direct energy and makes this flywheel run in the opposite direction until its energy gets transferred back into the spring to compress it. Now it compresses, again it goes forward, reverse, forward, reverse. So the energy is being transferred between the flywheel to the spring and the spring back to the flywheel. Such an inductor capacitor network is called a tank circuit. It's what we call in electronics an oscillator circuit. Let's look at it in a practical sense. Okay, before which, let's have a look at our syllabus. We're talking about oscillator circuits, and we'll look at it in detail. So, the moment I say oscillators, why, how is it related to amplifiers? That's your question, right? We will answer this question at the end of the session. Yes, the first condition for oscillation, it needs to have a positive feedback, and the gain, overall gain of the system, when the power comes back to the system to make it oscillate, it should be equal to 1. Okay, let's understand this in detail. Now, this is a simple circuit. I have an inductor which can store current. I have a capacitor which can store voltage. Inductor stores current in the form of a magnetic field. Capacitor st store voltage in the form of a charge, Q. If I charge, if I let current flow through this inductor with this battery, so I have an ISO, I'll close the switch, current flows from this battery through this inductor. Yes, let's do that. Now, there's a current flowing through the inductor. The moment, look at the direction of the current. The moment I let the switch open, the current continues to flow. Instead, when this current continues to flow, it goes, can't go back to the circuit because the circuit is open. It flows into the capacitor and the capacitor gets charged. It saturates, then it can't give any more current. The current starts discharging because this circuit is a closed circuit. So it's oscillating forward and reverse through the inductor capacitor circuit and such an oscillation is what you see in this voltage and current curves through the inductor and capacitor. In other words, the inductor's current lags the voltage, the capacitor's current leads the voltage considering the previous cycle. So this process is what we call as oscillation. In the case of a resistor, the inductor, the current and the voltage are in phase but amplitudes have a little difference. And this oscillation is what you see in the case of a simple tank circuit. There's something similar to what we saw with a capacitor and inductor. In this case, it's similar to a flywheel and a spring in a mechanical system. Now, 
So let's go back to see it and how we can compare it back to a flywheel and a spring. So the mass of your metal is what is moving to and fro and that's your, move, that's your kinetic energy, it's what's stored in the flywheel. When it goes to the end, it's loaded like a spring. So these two ends would be your capacitor, any path in between that the movement is there is your flywheel path. So inductance charge transfer to the capacitor, capacitor back to the inductor, inductor back to the capacitor, capacitor back to the inductor. So this process is what causes oscillation in your mechanical system. The same thing can happen. Now the neat thing is I'm able to get a frequency based on the flywheels, the value of how much of energy can be stored in the flywheel and how much of energy can be stored in the spring. And this frequency would be your natural frequency of your system. Now, let's look at it in a different dimension. I can tap this energy and have a sustained oscillation when I have an amplifier connected to the system and the output of the amplifier is given back as an input to the system to make it sustain, sustain its oscillation. Let's look at that in detail. Okay, now looking at our syllabus, let's look at it how different tank circuits have been used by different experts to, in the past and they have had their names written in history to design oscillators based on resistors, capacitors and inductors. Basically inductors and capacitors where they store ch I mean, uh, power either as a charge or as magnetic field. Uh, how, okay, I'm using a simple software for online simulation and uh, you can do it too to understand how these circuits work. If you look at circuits, you have transistors, under transistors you have oscillators and you have culpits and Hartley oscillator and crystal oscillator. So these are the oscillators. So this is a Colpitz oscillator. Now the Colpitz oscillator, you have one inductor and two capacitors in your tank circuit. This oscillation output is fed into a transistor and this transistor output switches between on and off every time the current flows to the base. And this is what you see as an output. So this transistor can turn on and off and that on and off cycles goes from zero to maximum and maximum to zero. So if you want to increase the simulation speed, you can see how the current flows and how this oscillator works. So this is a Colpitz oscillator, one inductor, split capacitors and the capacitor oscillation current that's flowing through is fed to the base of a transistor in common emitter, board, the emitter mode and this is an NPN transistor and this output is your switched output. Actually you're not taking power from the oscillator tank circuit using this oscillation frequency to oscillate your tank circuit and the oscillating tank circuit operates a base of a transistor. The base of the transistor lets the current flow through the collector and this collector voltage is what you see as your output. Hope I've not confused you. Yes, so as we saw about transistors as a switch, this oscillating current is switching the transistor on and off. That's it. Okay, let's look at Hartley oscillator. It's something similar. Instead, we have one capacitor with two inductors. In other words, the inductors are split. Same concept all over again. So this circuit is called Hartley oscillator. Concept just the same. Let's increase the simulation speed to see what happens. So since its inductors are split, the waveform is a little different. The concept is similar. Yes. Now let's look at the next part of your topic, which is RC phase shift oscillators. We talked about capacitors can store voltage. Yes, and there is a power factor difference. In other words, ideally, in theory, a capacitor should have 90 degree leading power factor. To have an oscillator sustain its oscillation, we need to have a 180, I mean, a phase shift, exactly a 180 degree phase shift. Since in practical, a capacitor can have a 60 degree phase shift, I have one RC network giving 60 degree phase shift, another RC network making it one, this output connects to the next phase, uh, giving another 120 degree phase shift. In other words, I'm inducing a delay. So a 60 de degree delay, a 120 degree delay, now I got a 180 degree delay, and this 180 degree phase shift is my feedback loop back to my system. In other words, at what frequency does it oscillate? This output back in. This feedback loop, after all these delays, Figures is triggered back into the base of the transistor to make an oscillator. Let's look at the same circuit. Instead of using a transistor, we're going to be using an op amp or an operation amplifier to see it oscillate. So I'll talk about 60 degrees, 120 degrees, and then your 180 degree phase shift. And instead of your transistor using an op amp, we'll study about this in the next unit in detail. And I would be able to get a sustained oscillation. And the frequency depends on the values of R and C.
So this is called an RC phase shift oscillator. In other words, I'm able to shift the phase in multiple stages to get the desired 180 degree phase shift that I require to get the oscillator sustain its oscillation. Yes. Now, the last part of oscillation is one unique concept, which is actually a mechanical crystal. Let's look it look at it in practical to see exactly what does it look like in practice. This is called a crystal oscillator. If you look at our transmitter board, you would see a 40.68 small metallic, uh, metal tank. That's a crystal oscillator. Let's see if I can get a better view of it. Can you see the metal tank on the board? That is a crystal oscillator. For example, that's what keeps your watch ticking exactly at one second every time. The truth is, the crystal oscillator might have a really high frequency. And the reason I'm able to get it down to one second is because it's operating at 32,768 hertz. And you divide the frequency 15 times in half, you would get one second. And that's how your watch is in sync and ensures it does not even miss a beat in a day. It might have an error of what 15 minutes in a year in 365 days, which is pretty less for a watch. And you can have better quality watches which can have the frequency closer to 32,768 hertz and give you a precise one second. So this has a crystal oscillator. This is a crystal oscillator. This is what it looks in, in reality. Now, we talked about the mechanical flywheel as an inductor. We talked about the mechanical spring, electro, I mean, the mechanical spring as a capacitor. But there are two types of uh, capacitors that you can see in the market. One is the one that we saw earlier. This is a tank type capacitor or, or an electrolytic capacitor. These capacitors can charge only in one direction. In other words, can be used only in DC circuits. It has a polarity. It has a polarity. In other words, the black side would be your minus. The other, the other pin would be your plus. In other words, if I reverse this capacitor, I would destroy it. It's like looking at a spring that is only an expansion spring. You can't compress it. It can only charge. It can charge. Yes, it is a capacitor. It is a spring, but can only charge in one direction. It does not have, if you try to discharge it in another direction, you would destroy it. That's exactly what an electrolytic, electrolytic capacitors are. At the other same time, you also have other capacitors that you would see in these kind of boards that are the standalone capacitors, the small yellow color blobs. Yes? Or the small ceramic capacitors. You would see a lot of them for isolation purposes. These capacitors, the small yellow color ones, can be charged in both directions, something like a spring that can use in compression, it can store charge. Also in relaxation, when you expand it, also can store a charge, it will restore, come back to zero. When you compress it, it comes back to zero. So this type of capacitors can be used in AC circuits and such capacitors can be used in DC circuits. Yes. And what is an inductor? Inductor can be used in a circuit. It would resist the change in direction of current. In other words, if I spin it in forward direction, I can't off spin, uh, change the direction very easily. Changing its direction will be very difficult because all the energy is stored in the form of kinetic energy. So if I want to change its direction, I need to destroy the kinetic energy, bring it down to zero, and then change its direction. That's what we've been doing. If you look at the graph, it's a sine wave. So changing its direction is difficult. The higher the inductance of the value of the inductor, changing its current direction will be very difficult. In this case, maybe a small tester, a lightweight tester, since its mass is very less, its stored kinetic energy is less, I can change its direction pretty easily, but not as much as this heavy flywheel. In practical circuits, what does it look like? Your capacitors look like these green color tanks and your inductors is this toroidal core inductor. That's your electronics. So your flywheel is here and your spring is here. So such inductors and capacitors are very common in electronics. They are used in high power electronics in this form factor. And you look at it in the microscopic level when you talk about I mean, your electronics that you see in cell phones, yes. Your inductor store current is here, this blob, and your capacitor is a small dot at the edge. So this is a capacitor. How do you know it? It has the alphabet C beside it for capacitor, L for inductor. This, as you saw earlier in the last class, transistors with Q. And this red color thing, the glass bead-like thing, is your diode. And even this black blob is a diode. So, and then you also have two capacitors here so close. So, in reality, electronics is small. Concepts are the same. This stores current, this stores charge in a dielectric. Yes? Now let's look at it 
in the practical aspects of in theoretical aspects of how do I go about ensuring that oscillation happens in circuits. Okay. So now we see the equivalent circuit of crystal. In other words, and I want to express it in an electronic form. Though it's a crystal, it's actually made of quartz material. In other words, when you say quartz, quartz is naturally available crystal which has a property called piezoelectric property and this property is what in other words if i give it mechanical input if i squeeze this crystal it will give me an electrical charge if i give it electrical charge it will have mechanical deformation so in other words it has energy storage in the form of inductance and capacitance so this is the equivalent circuit of a quartz, a quartz crystal in a crystal oscillator so we talked about the small metallic tank that you see in your wireless transmitter that crystal is exactly this as a symbol. Equivalent circuit is your RLC with the C in parallel. Now, if you want to put this, use this crystal to generate frequency. Example, I need to wirelessly transmit a particular signal over at large distance for my toy transmitter to make my toy work remotely. Then I use a crystal oscillator. Now, how does that work? How does that oscillate? Now, this is a circuit that can explain how does this oscillate. Now, this is your crystal equivalent circuit and this equivalent circuit is operating your base of your transistor to ensure it oscillates so that output oscillation is actually a power supply being on and off and that waveform is what you see in this graph and this is the current through the inductor the current the, the current that's lagging the voltage and that's what you see in this waveform so you can have oscillations in many ways in, in Hartley and Colpitt's oscillators, you have a tank circuit where the, either the capacitor is split or the inductor is split, feeding your base of your transistor to turn it on and off. In the case of a phase shift oscillator, you have mul uh, RC networks, multiple resistors and capacitors connected in series, cascaded to be able to give you the phase shift that you desire and fed back to the base of a transistor to get the 180 degree phase shift and that causes sustains oscillations. In the case of a crystal oscillator, the crystal as a tank circuit feeds the base of a transistor to get the oscillations that you desire. So we have studied all but different oscillators and different applications and if you have any questions or you want to do your own experiments feel free to use this website and create your own oscillator circuits feel free to experiment with them to understand the practical aspects of how these circuits oscillate. You can play with the specifications like you want to talk about the inductance capacitance value or the simulation speed or the current speed to see how it flows to understand how this transistor is turned on and off through the base input and the real current that's flowing through it is actually the current from your applied power supply through the transistor into the ground and that potential is what you see on your output so feel free if you have any questions reach out to me and i'll be able to explain all those concepts of electronics in a way that a mechanical engineer can understand it better thank you and have a great day. And sorry, uh, let's come back to this point that we missed talking about, which talked about the amplifier and why is it linked to amplifiers. We talked about oscillators need to have an amplified signal to sustain its oscillation. If you don't sustain its oscillation, the frequency would dampen out. In other words, when you talk about deflecting a blade, as you saw earlier. The oscillations oscillate, yes it does oscillate, but it dies out at a particular point of time. This dying out process is called dampening. So to sustain this oscillation we talked about, the feedback loop and the gain to be greater than 1 or equal to 1 to be able to sustain the oscillation. And this is what happens when you have your microphone from your amplifier, which is on the input side on the other side, brought in close proximity to your speaker, which is your output of your amplifier. So when your output gets this input from your speaker actually I mean the, uh, the input which is the microphone which is connected to your amplifier is brought in close proximity to your speaker you hear a whistling noise and that whistling noise is oscillation that's why amplifiers are linked with oscillators so amplifier with its output and input connected together is an oscillator so that is why we started off with amplifiers and this would be the end of the third unit thank you and have a great day